This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library main branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's unsupervised learning. Hey, everybody. Uh, I am here right now with Dr. Gregory Clark of UC Davis, uh, economic historian of some note, uh, perhaps renowned and uh, now a bit of infamy. So uh, could you could you talk about what's going on, Greg, and then we'll get into the scholarship um, after the news. Yeah, uh, so I was due last Wednesday to give a talk to the economics department, which is in the business school in Glasgow University. And I kind of playfully titled the talk for whom the bell curve tolls uh, a lineage of 400,000 people shows that genetics determines most social outcomes and it was quite a technical talk about what we could learn from this lineage of seven generations uh, about what it is that actually predicts uh, social outcomes and then I heard nothing until the day of the talk, and I actually came on early to talk to some faculty members and then learned that the, the thing had been uh, suspended. Uh, and uh, the story I got then was that uh, the sociology department had launched a, a protest against the seminar. Uh, this is a little surprising to me, actually, someone like UC Davis, the dean, oh, and the dean then had insisted on the postponement. And as I say, it's a little surprising to me because at Davis, the dean doesn't control the content of seminars. Yeah, and, so it's, it's, it, would be the, it would be the department, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the dean uh, doesn't control it, but it got even more bizarre because... Then I was told by a faculty member that the dean was proposing a compromise. And the compromise would be that if I would just drop in the title any use of the words bell curve, the seminar could go ahead. <laughs> and apparently- Well, that's, that's triggering. Trig yes. <laughs> and anything that might potentially refer to Charles Murray uh, though actually in constructing that title, I was actually more uh, playing off that, that my previous book, uh, there had been a review in the Chronicle of Higher Education, which was quite hostile and which concluded, you know, for whom the bell curve tolls Gregory Clark, it tolls for thee. Uh, and so I was actually just playing with that, uh, you know, title. Uh, and, and also with the idea, of course, that there's a, a normal distribution uh, with additive genetic transmission of various social abilities. Well, I, so did you just think of substituting normal distribution to everywhere you said bell curve? <laughs> well, it, it only occurred in the title of the paper, uh, but I, I felt that that one, when I talked to the dean, I just felt... I'm not, you know, if someone had approached me beforehand and said, well, this might trigger some unnecessary aggro, I would have said, it doesn't matter, it's just the title. But once we reached that point, I, I was not going to change the title in some sense as an admission that this was somehow improper or racist or something like that. Uh, and because and there was absolutely nothing in that title, which I thought was in any sense improper. Uh, and so we had to stand up then with the Dean. Uh, and meanwhile, the Times in London got hold of the story. And so they wrote up a whole article, but, uh, but the thing was that the student newspaper in Glasgow labeled it as postponement of talk by eugenicist. <laughs> wait, how many, how many, wait, so how many children do you have, Greg? Uh, three. So you're above replacement. Oh, so that that would make me a eugenicist, I guess. Um, I'm just saying your you 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 your your reproductive fitness is above above replacement. It's above you know, that's above true. one. So um, I mean, so is it so eugenicist from, from online the internet? This is like a catch-all term that people just kind of throw out there. Um, yeah, no, I mean, you know, and, and, and see, it's not something I've written anything on or you know talked about or you know, thought about, uh, and. <laughs> 
then I guess they came in for some criticism in the student newspaper because they revised the article and put eugenesis in quotation marks so as to have a more balanced report <laughs> on the event. Uh, and anyway, the, so then the Times uh, has run a piece and then the Times in Scotland, there's a separate paper there, has an editorial, which is actually, I thought, much better uh, on this. Uh, and now uh, the Frankfurter Allemagne Zeitung uh, is going to run an article on Saturday, I think, on this. Uh, and so it's really kind of taken off. Um, and it turns out that I did learn that there was a petition submitted to the principal of the university by 110 faculty demanding that the talk not be allowed. Uh, do, do you know? And so this is. Do you know the distribution of like is it economics, business, sociology, social? I mean, I, there was. I don't think there was any serious concern about this in economics, and so I, I think it was centered on the sociology department. But the university presented it that they were concerned about student protests. Uh, but as I say, I think this actually was mainly coming from the faculty initially, at least. And then another coincidence was that Glasgow on the day of my talk was due to issue a report on kind of systemic racism at the university over the last 20 years and promises to do better. And so it was felt that this would be undermining to the university's attempts to apologize for its past. And so it just produced a kind of a perfect uh, storm in terms of uh, 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 what happened. But the university's official position is that actually it hasn't canceled the seminar. It's just postponed it. <laughs> what's, that, I mean, what is, what is your, um, what's your status? I mean, you, you have some seniority at Davis, you have tenure. Um, has this crossed the pond in any way aside from social media? Like, are you worried that you're going to be uh, no, uh, you know, well, the center of the eye, eye of Sauron? Thankfully, uh, tenure is still significant protection in uh, U.S. universities. Um, I do have a kind of a short term, shorter term, like three year visiting appointment at LSE. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me that much if somehow that was terminated. Um, and, but, but as I say, the, the absurd thing about this is that the dean of the business school read over the paper and said, I don't see any issue. It's just these two words in the title. Yeah, yeah. That's so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'm just laughing because there's an absurdist element to a lot of this. Um, that oh no! I mean, it 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 is like a, a you know a comic novel about academia, <laughs> where uh, a pun uh, leads to uh, a complete chaos, and where the administration, I think, is tying itself in knots at the university, figuring out what to do about this. Um, and but uh, you know, it. Uh, and the, then the other thing that was thrown in kind of randomly is that somehow my work was racist. Uh, this study is about white British people <laughs> and almost exclusively white British people. Uh, so there's, no, there's nothing in the work that has anything to do with race. Um, but as I say, once these accusations start flying, uh, it just becomes a kind of a catch-all um, and uh, anyway, we shall see uh, what happens. And then there are people, of course, on the other side uh, who, you know, are, are you know, wanting to uh, criticize the universities for their kind of wokeism. Uh, and so somehow I've just caught in, in the middle of uh, all of that. But, but as I say, my own position is, you know, I, I don't need to give a talk <laughs> at Glasgow University. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and I would be happy to, uh, but as a regular academic talk, you know, because one of the other things I fear is that they are then going to somehow 
insist that there be a counter speaker or something like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that's the situation. <laughs> Sounds like a little bit of a circus that you're trying to avoid. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, it, I mean, in hindsight, uh, making a type a little more provocative is a danger. But, but the, the weird thing is, I, th I think this is what academic life should be about, right? It's about taking significant positions, taking risks and saying here, I think we can understand this in this particular way as opposed to this other way <laughs> uh, and debating the outcomes. And there could be lots of criticism, lots of uh, 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 finding of fault with what you're doing. Uh, but it just, it just was amazing to me that we'd reached a point where simply the assertion that genetics matters significantly for social outcomes is now enough to cancel <laughs> a speaker. Uh, yeah. That, I would yeah. say it's a, a surprising place. Yeah. Um, so I guess like, uh, let's just, let's get off the culture war stuff because whatever. Um, uh, so can you talk about, uh, you know, I first encountered your work, Farewell to Alms, uh, that book, um, I guess like 13, 14 years ago. I mean, 13 years ago it was published, but I'm sure you were working on it before that. Um, you know, you had some really good accolades. Um, Brad DeLong, economist at Berkeley, uh, really praised the book for whatever disagreements he had. A few people were kind of annoyed. Um, they did feel like you were presenting. I mean, eugenicists might not be right, but, uh, you know, just the emphasis on uh, heritable changes, perhaps cultural or genetic over time, um, offended some people. And then, uh, you know, your book, uh, I think Sun Also Rises, right? Uh, yep. About mm -hmm. rare surnames and heritability of status. And now this book, um, or this this work you're doing, uh, um, it's not out of the book yet, um, will also be about a similar topic. Um, so, you know, I mentioned offhand on Twitter that um, I was going to talk to you and I got a, a message from somebody who will remain nameless, but is familiar with your work. And they were like, well, you know, they were basically saying they think you're a genetic determinist um, and, and uh, you know, they're not like into cancellation. They're just like, this is just going to give Greg more um, publicity, really, for his ideas, as opposed to doing anything against them. And um, I mean, wh what do you, what do you um, say in reaction to the argument that you're genetic determinist? Because I, I know a little bit about the work that you, the empirical work. Um, I don't know as much about the model building you've done. Uh, and it does seem like you're finding these constant parameters of heritability across societies. Uh, but you know, it, are you genetic determinist? I mean, what does that even mean to you? I don't really know what it means a lot of the time because, you know, for me as a geneticist, uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, if you have two copies, the penetrance is really high and you're going to get cystic fibrosis. That's determined by your genes. But when it comes to a lot of these quantitative traits on the individual level, there's so much residuals, there's so much noise. It's, it's hard to say you're a genetic determinist, even if it's highly heritable. So um, I've been talking for a while. Can you outline your general views here? Yeah, no, and so the important thing that the paper and, and that the book will emphasize, and, and what I should say is the book really is the third part of a trilogy <laughs> where uh, A Farewell to Arms was about demography in the pre-industrial world and its potential consequences for population characteristics. And then uh, The Sun Also Rises was about, about the incredible strength of inheritance of characteristics and, and interesting patterns. And then this third book, which is based on a, an eight year study <laughs> to assemble this lineage of across seven generations of 400,000 people in Britain. Um, it's really going to try and look at what the exact mechanisms are, were of transmission and, and did they involve genetics mainly. And, but the important thing about this study is that it's going to say that, that very slow rates of social mobility are actually the consequence of two things. One is a pattern of marriage, which is very highly assortative by people's social capabilities. And then the second one is genetic transmission. And that actually is a mixture of both then of genetic elements, but also very important social elements. And if you had kind of random marriage, 
you have much faster rates of social mobility. But the other very interesting consequence of this social institution of marriage, uh, at least if you observe it in a society like England, is that it would over time have very significant impacts on the overall distribution of certain social abilities within society. Uh, because, and that would take generations for those effects uh, to play out. Uh, and so it's a kind of a, another kind of way in some sense in which you could say perhaps it's actually was this social institution that helped create the modern world uh, by its effect on the population distribution of various outcomes. Uh, and so, so as I say, so in, in some sense it's genetic determinism, but it's actually, there's some very important social elements that also occur in the story. And I'm completely aware that there's huge random elements in transmission of these things between generations. But I'm pre pretty comfortable that that is true randomness, that it's not something that can be changed by kind of social interventions. And so in terms of, you know, what you can actually determine this is actually going to be, you know, genetics as the, the transmission mechanism, but social institutions is playing a very important role. Yeah, I mean, so let's 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 talk about like uh, specific fine grained empirical findings then, um, which uh, I, I I did talk to you a while ago about this, so I don't know if you found something new. Um, can you talk about like persistence of class status across generations and what you found cross culturally? Well, um, so in the, in the English data, we can observe in this lineage, the correlations across any two types of individuals in the lineage. And it's also possible, we have a, another set of data for England on, on marriages that goes back to 1837 and involves several million marriages where the marriage record in England contains information on the occupation of the father of both parties and of the groom and the bride, and also information on the literacy of the groom and the bride. And so it's possible in England to actually derive estimates of how assortative marriage was over time <laughs> and what the underlying assortment is. And it turns out that those associations are very close, those correlations between your own father and your wife's father. And that implies that marriage is involving this very high degree of assortment. And then in a simple additive genetic model, if we throw in that kind of marriage parameter, we can then derive predictions about what the pattern of correlations will be between relatives. And I can show in the lineage that those correlations are exactly the ones we find. And the R squared of that fit is typically between 0.92 and 0.98. Right, tell, tell, tell the listener what R squared is. That's a really high R squared in social science. Yes, yes, it's an enormously high R squared. So R squared is the share of the variance that's actually going to be explained by the uh, the determining variable, right? It's how much you can explain as opposed to the randomness in this expression. And so as I say, it's, it's impressive, the fit. Uh, another thing we can do is that, again, in simple additive genetic model, uh, if there's mating by the parents, which is on the genotype, then the correlation between a parent and the child will be the same as the correlation between two children on any characteristic. Yeah. And again, that relationship fits with an R squared of almost one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's just that these, the simple model fits the data from this lineage just very surprisingly well. Another thing is that in a genetic explanation, even though women did not have formal occupations or education in Britain, it should be that you get as much of your outcome from your mother as from your father. And we can test that in the lineage by looking at what's the predictive power of the maternal grandfather versus the paternal grandfather in terms of grandchild outcomes. And you get 
for education and for occupational status, exact symmetry. Uh, I mean, to, to just an incredible degree of fit. But for wealth, you can actually see that the transmission of wealth, social institutions matter because for wealth, the predictive power of the paternal grandfather is three times as great as for the maternal grandfather. And so there you can actually see that, yes, there are differences in things like transmission of wealth, but if you want something like, what's your educational potential? Uh, it's coming equally from both sides. All right. Uh, and, and so the book actually is going to consist of a bunch of kind of chapters which will test implications of this story. And so, for example, it'll look at what's the effect of family size? What's the effect of birth order? What happens if your parents die when you're young? And here the astonishing answer is it doesn't affect your outcomes. <laughs> and, and you would think that's crazy. I mean, in the 19th century England, but it turns out there's a very nice study done just recently in Sweden of the 1918 influenza epidemic where they can look at children who lost their parents in that epidemic. And that's effectively a, a random intervention. And in, in that study, which is done for the entire population, they find almost no effect of losing a parent, uh, say when you're under age 10, in terms of your, uh, I think it's the uh, occupational outcomes. Um, so, so as I say, the, so the book really is going to be just an, an exploration of how far can we get <laughs> with very simple uh, structure uh, and, you know, how much more, what, what do we need more in order to explain these outcomes? And, and one of the, the very significant findings here is that the underlying rate of persistence the, the correlation between, of underlying the data between you and, and the previous generation is in the order of something like 0.85 in the data. And, and so there's a lot of variance in, in the first generation, but thereafter the decline in correlation is a, of that order of 0.85 per generation. And so persistence goes on through many, many generations. You know, I, I have some questions, but um, I think you need to elaborate on this a little because I'm assuming many listeners are aware of the intergenerational income correlations, which are considerably lower in the United States. I think they're like around 0.5 or 0.4. And so um, can you talk about why it's so high during subsequent generations and why it matters? Right. I mean, so uh, if we measure, I mean, it depends what characteristic you measure. Uh, the English data is actually a bit better. So if you look at, say, occupational status, the first generation correlation is in the order of 0.6 or 0.7. But what's interesting then is that in the simple additive genetic model, it's a very clear prediction that the uh, correlation decline as we go from father to son and now look at grandfather to son, the correlation decline should be whatever the father-son correlation was multiplied by one plus M over two, where M is the genetic correlation between the parents. Uh, and so that correlation should be declined by a half if you had random mating and by much less if you have highly assortative uh, mating. And so in this data, we can then set out to calculate these correlations and we should see a consistent decline across each generation of the same amount. And we do see that in the data. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, and so I'd say we, we can learn a lot uh, about these patterns uh, by looking across the lineage. And what I try and do in this paper and what we'll try and do in the book is to say, well, what would you expect if you had a model of cultural inheritance? What would you expect if you had a kind of an economic model of inheritance of characteristics? And the idea will be in the book is to you know, have a horse race between different uh, paths of inheritance. And so for example, on a cultural model, you would expect that children 
would be more closely correlated with each other in a family than they would be with their parents. Uh, because the children are going to be growing up in the same environment within the family, whereas the environment between generations has to be shifting in order to get constant regression to the mean. Uh, and so that's something we can actually test nicely with this data. Uh, and, but as I say, we don't find that. We don't find that children are more closely correlated with each other. And so, so as I say, so the whole idea of the book is just going to be to take a simple model of uh, inheritance and then just see how far can we go with that? And you know, when are we going to encounter patterns of correlation or something that, that say this isn't working anymore, something else is happening. There's social interventions here that really matter uh, in this case. And, and we do see it, right? So again, for the inheritance of wealth, family size does matter to how much wealth people inherit, um, but only uh, to how much wealth people have by the end of their own lives. We measure wealth only at the end of everyone's lives. Uh, so family size does matter, but only in the case where wealth is actually inherited from the parents. Where wealth is generated in the course of the lifetime, family size makes, has no influence in terms of the, the size of the wealth different children will have. Um, so, so, so as I say, that's just the, the concept of the book. Well, so um, you have a lot of data from England. Uh, do you have data from other nations, other societies? No, I, I think the plan here really was for a number of reasons was to just concentrate on England. And what, what we can do in England, I think is there are very few other societies where you, you could build up such a long and kind of complete uh, lineage uh, of people. Uh, and that's just because of the nature of the English records, uh, maybe in Scandinavia. So people are trying to do some of this now also in Scandinavia. Uh, but I think it, it, in England, it's, it's possible for some people to go 10 generations deep. And so, so it's, it's a very nice set of data. And then we know all of the institutional changes that were occurring in England over this period. And again, we can ask, well, what happens when there's the introduction of mass subsidized public education? For people starting in the late 19th century and then moving through the 20th century, uh, is it doing anything to rates of intergenerational mobility? Is it affecting what's happening, particularly at the bottom of the distribution? Uh, and so, as I say, I, I like it just that it's you know it's it's nicely confined, and we have all of this incredible marriage data for England as well. And then another aspect of the data that we have for England that I've been working on is we know what overall reproductive success of people is. We can actually calculate for people who attended Oxford or Cambridge, going back all the way to people born in the 1680s at least, all the way up to the present time practically, uh, what was their uh, reproductive success? And you actually see very interesting differences in pattern across time. And so in the 18th century, uh, on average, this sector of the population was doubling its share of the population each generation. But very dramatically and very suddenly in the mid 19th century for people born in the 1850s and later, the reproductive success of that group in the population dropped below two children per family, per uh, parent, sorry, per, person in each generation. Uh, and so you actually do see these dramatic shifts in the kind of the, the dynamic of the population. And if it really is the case that, that social outcomes are driven by additive genetic processes, then you would actually see significant shifts in the share of the favorable genetics within the population. And also, I haven't worked this out yet, but also potentially significant shifts in the distribution across the society of these uh, favorable genetics. Uh, and so uh, that, of course, is going to, to lead people into the questions of eugenics and stuff like that. 
But for my purposes, I'm just interested in what does the dynamic look like in the society in that case, right? Uh, and, and it's quite dramatic in the period leading up to the Industrial Revolution, the, uh, the relative share of that educated population is actually increasing very sharply within the population. And then, of course, it goes into reverse later. And as I say, this, is, this will <laughs> lead to all kinds of potential trouble, but it is just a kind of an interesting uh, consequence of the data. And it does go back to the questions that were raised in A Farewell to Arms about did the pre-industrial demographic patterns do anything in terms of the characteristics of populations. And I think this data will demonstrate that it, they could potentially have quite significant effects over relatively short periods of time because of this is additive genetic transmission yeah. and you can change the share of say favorable or unfavorable uh, uh, you know, genes uh, very rapidly uh, within uh, the time periods we're looking at. Well, so let me, um, let me step back for, for the listener a bit. Um, some of them have genetics backgrounds. They know what additive genetic variance is. I wanna just mention it offhand. So additive genetic variance is basically, you can think of it as linear effects in the genome. Um, you know, one copy, two copy, two copy has twice the effect and the genetic effects are distributed across many genes in an additive way. So you can just add them up together instead of like trying to think about linear or think about interaction effects. Um, this is in contrast to what a lot of people learn with Mendelian genes with dominance and recessive where, you know, obviously there are many cases where one copy is the same as two copies when dominance is affected. And then there are other cases where there's, you know, gene gene interactions. We don't need to go to that, but this is basically just like a simple model of mixing um, is one way to think about it in terms of the expected value. It's really intuitive in that way. The way it's not intuitive is that there's still variance. So when two people that are very tall have offspring, their offspring tend to be very tall because, you know, additive genetic variance, like, you know, they're going to be tall. They get the tall genes, right? But within that, there's still a non-heritable component that is uh, developmental noise. And um, the way the genes are also being sampled from the parents, depending on the genetic architecture, is going to introduce some noise. So some, peop some people are going to get the, quote, shorter genes of their parents, and some people are going to get the longer genes of their parents. And so what you do traditionally in a lot of uh, quantitative population genetic analyses of these families is look at the genetic correlations of relatedness and how heritable, um, and heritable here has a very specific meaning of the uh, proportion of the variation of the trait in the population that's due to genetic variance, um, usually that's additive genetic variance uh, for the narrow sense heritability, uh, you know, it is basically going to tell you how strong the correlations of the trait are between, between individuals based on their genetic relationship. So identical twins in a classic twin study uh, usually are much more similar on extremely heritable traits than full siblings who are more similar than cousins and so forth until you get to unrelated individuals. Um, Greg, listening to you talk, basically you are saying here, social status is the characteristic that's being predicted and um, the underlying additive genetic variance is leading into you know, various phenotypes, various behaviors, perhaps various aptitudes that allow for the acquisition of social status or wealth. I mean, is, is that a correct summary of what's going on here? That, that's correct. I mean, and social status is a complex thing because it's a, it's a mixture of, say, intellectual abilities, but also drive, self-confidence. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that are going in there. Uh, and, you know, we, we, through modern whole genome studies, we have some idea, some of the genetics that matters on that. Um, but, uh, but, but I'd say the, the nice thing about the book it will be that once it's published, uh, the data will all be there. And so if someone thinks, no, 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 there's a completely different way of explaining what's happening here, uh, they're welcome to attempt that, right? I mean, the, there will be a complete set of data. Uh, and uh, the, um, but, but as I say, what is, what is amazing uh, about this is that the patterns you observe were those predicted by Fisher in his famous 1918 paper. Uh, but with, as I say, this one oddity that for some reason, 
assortment is at a very high level in marriage. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you have assortment, so, so assortment here, Greg is talking about like basically on a characteristic, um, you know, what's the correlation between the spouses. So, you know, if tall people marry, you know, then that's positive assortment. Um, sometimes there's, there is, I think there are cases of negative assortment of characteristics across the sexes, but I can't think, I mean, you know, opposites attract is a stereotype of that. Although my understanding is that's actually false, but I'm presumably there are, there is some sort of negative assortment. Right. I mean, if you look at genetic well, relatedness, there is some of that siblings do not marry. Right. So, uh, so, so we have that, but you were saying something, Greg. Oh yeah. I mean, what, what is interesting in this data is that if you look at the, phenotype assortment in marriage, uh, it's not that high, right? It's highest for things like years of education, but then it's still only around about 0.5 is the correlation. Uh, for this model to explain what's happening here, the genotype correlation has to be higher than the phenotype correlation. And you would think, well, you know, how's that possible? Uh, but some recent whole genome studies using the British Biobank data found exactly this for the predictor of years of education in England, that the genotype correlation is in the order of, I think something like 0.7, while the phenotype correlation is lower in terms of years of actual achieved education. And I think the answer is that when someone decides how to marry someone else, they have a lot more information than is typically given in phenotype studies. Uh, and somehow they're using that information to match with someone who has these social characteristics that very closely echo their own. Uh, and as I say, that's a very interesting social pattern because there's nothing that says we should mate in this way, right? Uh, I mean, marriage could be who's the youngest person who's available, who's the most attractive person who's available, who's the richest person who's available. <laughs> uh, but somehow the, the evidence in Britain is very strong that people are actually matching on some kind of latent variable at a very high correlation in the order of like 0 0.8, 0 0.85. Uh, and that this is what is actually creating a world of, of relatively very slow social mobility over time. And also a world where, you know, you get a lot of variation in one generation, but people somehow seem like they have a memory of what lineage they came from. And so if your grandfather went to Oxford or Cambridge, your father might not go there, but your chance as a grandchild of going there would be much higher than for a lineage where there wasn't someone in earlier generations who had actually gone there. And, and that's exactly what you would expect from this uh, type of data with additive genetic uh, transmission. Uh, have you thought about, um, so like in terms of marriage, I mean, I wonder, like, so my stylized fact uh, or stylized prediction, I guess, as an economist would say, um, I would assume that um, people care less about this these latent variables today than they would in the past in particular because women are much more economically independent. Uh, as I say, we could measure this for marriages from 1837 to 2020, though our data is much more abundant for the 19th century. And the interesting suggestion from the data is that if anything, you're, you're correct, it's, it's becoming somewhat less assortative marriage in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, and that would actually then in this model be associated with rising rates of social mobility. Interestingly though, that's exactly the opposite of what a lot of people in economics have predicted because their view was that as women acquired more and more explicit educational status, occupational status, that marriage would become increasingly uh, assortative. Or so someone like Charles Murray has actually also emphasized this and the rates of social mobility would consequently uh, slow down. And so what's actually very interesting in the data is there's no sign of any increase in assortment over time, even though in the 19th century, middle-class women had no explicit occupations, no explicit educational status. <laughs> uh, Working-class women would have some occupational status, but much more limited than for men 
Um, and so, as I say, it, it's um, that that is the kind of interesting finding about the, the kind of the, the important role of social structure in terms of uh, these outcomes. Well, I mean, okay, so one thing is like, I mean, the correlations are just like incredibly high uh, that you're talking about. Um, did you have a prior on what you thought they were going to be? Well, we knew from the surname data that if that was going to be reflected in the individual data, which we thought it would be, these pattern of correlations would have to look as, as we find, right? And, and that's what's explaining why these surnames are showing this tremendous persistence of status. It's because of that underlying strength of kind of further correlations with each generation. Um, and so what we could actually, in this data, we have data going down easily to fifth cousins, who, if you think about this, are, you know, genetically a long way away from each other. Uh, they're still quite significantly correlated in this database. And these are people that you would never socially interact with. You wouldn't even know who your fifth cousins were. Yeah. Uh, but but so, so that is one, uh, you know, persistent finding then is of this uh, great strength of persistence, right? And it's, it's not huge once you get down to the level of fifth cousins, but it's still uh, surprising uh, that, uh, you know, that it's, it's so persistent within uh, the society. Um, and so, so as I say, it's, it's going to present a picture of a social world that has this great persistence and where it seems that genetic transmission is very important towards this. But another question that then comes up is, well, you know, you still have genetic transmission, but you can interrupt that transmission <laughs> through various interventions. And so another part of the book is going to look at, you know, social interventions that occurred in Britain over this time and whether they significantly changed outcomes, right, within the population. And in particular, <laughs> we have a study where we look at the extension of compulsory schooling in 1922, 1947, and 1972. And that took it up from 12 to 14 to 15 to 16 years. And we can look at the people just before this intervention and then just after. And so it's a, a nice discontinuity study. And, and we can look at what effect it had on people's longevity and what effect it had on their house value when we observed them in 1999. And uh, it's interesting, but there's, there's no effect of these interventions. The people who got from the government an extra half year of schooling in, say, 1972, uh, it didn't change their lives in any measurable way. Uh, and so, as I say, another, and, and we haven't, I haven't, finish looking at those aspects, but it is interesting that um, uh, it, it's, it's not just that you observe genetic transmission, but there's also going to be this question about, well, how much can you disrupt this? How much can you change this? Uh, I don't see much sign that social interventions are really able to do very much. Mm. Okay, so people ask me, um, I, I tweeted this out uh, just that I was talking to you uh, and people asked me like, I mean, what are the political implications? Some people have suggested that um, you're, um, let's just call them genetic determinists, okay? Your arguments here about the importance of genes implies that one should have a more robust social democratic system because life's not fair and it's not random. It's, you know, inscribed in your genes. Um, what, what do you think about that argument? Is that a plausible argument to you or do you reject it? And, I mean, um, I know you're, you're thinking well, as an empiricist here, but not normative. Right. Well, here's, here's a practical example. I mean, in the US now and also in Britain, there's a tremendous emphasis on schooling and the extension of schooling and the creation of universal schooling <laughs> for people. A lot of that schooling I think of as having very little social value. And so if I, if I think about a university like say Sacramento State, which is a second tier 
uh, university in California. A very large fraction of the students who, who go to that school will never graduate. <laughs> They'll acquire a bunch of debt in the course of not graduating. Uh, and it's just not clear what exact benefit that is generating for people. And so in some sense, we need to know, <laughs> are these social interventions really mattering in terms of people's outcomes? And, and the political implication of saying that, look, they don't matter, it's actually heavily driven by whatever your luck was in terms of your genetic endowment. It would say, well, wouldn't it be much better just to subsidize the incomes of people who had the bad luck in terms of the genetic endowment? Uh, and wouldn't, shouldn't we move much more to a kind of Scandinavian style social system? Uh, because, you know, an emphasis on the idea that it's, it's all changeable, it's all socially engineerable, uh, it, it's, it may lead us to, to a very unwise pattern of expenditures that are not actually benefiting the people that they're designed to benefit. And it's actually very hard to show, is there really any significant gain that people are getting from additional education in a society like the United States? Okay, I mean, I, you know, one thing I do have to say is like using terms like genetic endowments um, in, our, in our era, um, it's, yeah. I don't have a problem with the term, obviously, everybody knows that, but, um, everything is so sensitive now. Um, when you when you first like came onto the scene, you weren't even talking about genes, to be fair, but uh, I feel like people were just much more liberal about hearing different views. And um, I wonder if you've stayed in place and uh, the world around you has changed. Do you feel that ever? Um, I, I, I definitely do sense that, uh, there has been a bizarre kind of change in universities uh, where, you know, the idea of just a kind of a robust inquiry <laughs> uh, seems to have lost its attraction to people. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I, I don't know why we moved uh, in that direction. I mean, uh, in undertaking this book, I'm taking a lot of risks, right? I'm intruding into an area where it's, it's not my field inherently, right? Uh, I'm trying to do something that is relatively kind of simple, but kind of bold explanation of what's happening. Um, and I think that's fine. I mean, I'm ready to take that risk. Uh, I've you know, spent some time looking at this data, developing it, examining it. Um, but it doesn't seem like uh, we're living in an academic world where people can just say, okay, you know, you tried that idea, it didn't work, tough luck on you. <laughs> Uh, whereas instead, there's kind of uh, a condemnation for people even wanting to explore uh, what certain unfashionable ideas would, would end up implying. Uh, and so I, I agree, yes, it's, it's become a much more constrained uh, academic world. Well, um, okay, so you've been working on this uh, for a while. Um, and you're working on the book. Um, do you have any topics of interest that are somewhat different in the near future? Like, I mean, what are you what are you thinking about the rest of your career? I mean, that's a long time, hopefully. <laughs> um, but, uh, well, well you know, I, I must confess, this has been all consuming <laughs> because uh, you know the data requirements uh, are just enormous in terms of trying to put this. Uh, data together. Uh, and so basically all my energies uh, have been focused uh, on this. And, and it's, a, it's a pretty big uh, topic uh, with lots of different uh, ramifications. Um, and so uh, I, I, you know, I haven't had time <laughs> to think 
what would come next. Uh, and, uh, but I think, you know, hopefully once the book is finally done and the hope would be to finish it in six to 12 months from now, um, then I could start thinking about what, what else do I want to uh, look at or write about. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's the privilege and peril of an academic, you know, life is a little bit of a random walk, although you know your initial starting position, right? Yeah, and, and I mean, we all have, as academics have to say, well, there's lots of academics out there. In what way can I do something that would be different or a contribution, right? I'm not the smartest economist. I'm not the hardest working. <laughs> uh, I'm not the, the best writer. And so, he, the, but there are kind of niches, right? That there's just not a lot of people now in a subject like economic history. And there is very interesting data there. And so that's one thing is where I can say, look, other people don't realize the possibilities of a bunch of this data. And then secondly, there is actually some hope in studying unpopular ideas that you can do something because other people don't want to get uh, involved in something like that because they know that these ideas would be rejected, you know, initially by, by people. Uh, and and so, so as I say, it's in, in some sense that, you know, uh, what gives us the ability to do something in some sense sometimes is embracing unpopular things because uh you know if you you have you're willing to take that risk uh you can actually uh, do something that uh, you wouldn't otherwise be uh you know able to do all right um well i think you know i, I hit, hit on main uh, the main questions that i have i mean i'm excited to, to see your book and just kind of like review the data and the analyses myself. Um, I think a lot of listeners probably will be too. Um, you know, I, I think economic history is fascinating and, uh, you know, the models and the data are essential to like kind of understanding how the human past played out and to where we are. Um, you know, I know there are, you know, obviously it's academia, there are people out there who disagree with you. And I think the best thing is uh, kind of to let you speak and put your papers out there and, um, you know, engage, because uh, that's what the whole game is. Like, uh, we started this show with uh, kind of the circus and the sideshow of your, uh, the canceled talk. And, um, you know, even your critics, I think, uh, well, not necessarily all of them, but I mean, the ones that are adjacent to you or within your field, probably, actually, from what I've heard, uh, since I announced that I was going to talk to you is, they think this is silly and detracts from basically, you know, engaging with the data and showing how you're wrong is how they feel. But um, now this is going to be this stupid shy side show because of where we are as a culture. And this is definitely not a win-win. Um, this is a zero sum, probably a negative sum game for our culture. That's how I feel. Like, what do you think, Greg? Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I think in social science, we have very significant uh, problems. And that's another, so that's actually another thing that might attract me to, to look at in the future, which is what I've noticed in doing this work is that, I mean, all of the funders in social science want to fund things that show you how you can change the world <laughs> for people, right? They have no interest in any work that shows you how hard it is to change the world for people. Uh, and, and so the problem now we have is that in social science areas, systematically, the stuff that is published has to be stuff that shows effects. Uh, and uh, work that finds no effect from things like schooling interventions or from inheritance patterns or, you know, various other things like that, it's just very hard to get published and very and even harder uh, to get funded. And so for this study, I actually applied to the National Science Foundation, which had funded me before. And uh, the review, one of the reviewers said, why should we study anything like this that shows the importance of genetics 
we should only fund work that shows how you can change people's outcomes. <laughs> Uh, and, and so I think that, you know, we, we are in this uh, kind of situation where in social science areas, there's this, this huge prejudice in favor of certain types of explanations. And I don't know how we escape that. Yeah, I mean, I guess like the key is um, we just need to talk about it, expose it, make it clear. Because, um, you know, one of my convictions, you know, a, this has been an issue with uh, lab hypothesis origin and coronavirus 19 is, over the last year, there has been a disjunction between what scientists are willing to say on the record and what they will say to you privately. And it's not the biggest thing in the world, but it's really disturbing because you start to think, wait a second, what about other even more controversial things? Like, what do they really think? Well, I mean, who, who knows? Because they show no courage in um, speaking out in something that is, is kind of important. I don't know. Um, so um, hopefully uh, it's not going to get worse, uh, the cultural environment, and um, I'm excited to see your book when it comes out, and maybe we could talk about that later. Sounds good. All right. Good Take to talk care. to you. All right. This podcast for kids.